Nigerian governors express dissatisfaction with the mode of distribution of palliatives to vulnerable Nigerians that demand a reform. And Nigerian government backed tracks on rescue Nigerians abroad who want to return to the country. The Nigerian government has said it does not have the capacity and resources to deliver on this. This is Plus Politics, and I am Benny Ock. Nigerian governors have urged President Mohamed Buhari to reform the mode of distribution of palliatives to vulnerable Nigerians in order to prevent a crisis in the country. Governor Kaode Fayemi of Ikiti State, who also serves as the chairman of the Nigeria Governors Forum, the NGF, the current distribution method is limited as there are people who live on daily income and are yet to be included in the World Bank Assistance Scheme called the National Social Register, the NSR. It stated that parties will be even more meaningful if they were distributed through the governors. Joining us to have a conversation on this is politician Jimmy Agbaje, who will be live. He was live with me right here in the studio and a one-time gubernatorial candidate, PDP Lagos. Thank you very much, Mr. Jimmy, for joining us on Plus Politics. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, I want to backtrack to two days ago when um, the president gave the nationwide address, which made his second address bef um, before the first one. Now, what were the issues that were pretty much pertinent to you from that address economically and given the lockdown? Well, basically, it's that uh, we've got two challenges. We've got the challenge, of course, the health challenge um, of um, lockdown, which is that uh, people have to stay home. Uh, that's the first one. And, of course, the second one is um, we have an economy that, um, you know, is, is populated by small, more small enterprises or small and medium enterprises. We have a situation where quite a number of our people are even unemployed. And um, so, you know, it's like... You tell them to stay at home, they, they live day to day. Um, so there is a problem. And don't forget that even before COVID-19, we already had a situation of um, 100 million of our people living in what you call extreme poverty. poverty. Yeah. And that means that these are people who are earning less than 24,000, roughly, um, a month. Monthly. Now, you now have a situation where you've asked even those that make money uh, on a daily basis to join that number. I mean, yes. Of course, there, there, I mean, there is um, an overlap, but you would find that uh, more people are affected. So you look at the artisans, you look at the road transport workers and all, and they don't have any income any longer. Uh, so there is a problem. And uh, so the, you know, the argument would be, which do you do? Do you allow people to go on the road uh, and, and, and earn a living? Or do you lock them down and then look at how to take care of those uh, that have to eat, yes. have to leave? Um, and I think it brings to fore the challenges that, uh, the, the, the weaknesses in our structure, that we really have not had a structure in this country to look after the vulnerable, to look after the poor. Um, in more developed countries, th there is a structure. You can identify them. All right. Um, but we're going to come to those in a bit. We're going right. to come to those structures and how we can identify them and <coughs> if, if it's peculiar. If we, 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 we have a peculiar situation in Nigeria. Now, you're, you're a one-time um, gubernatorial candidate under the PDP in Lagos here. People have argued the fact that prior to the cessation order, the first cessation order by the president, that the, um, the executive governor of Lagos State, Babajide Saolu, was on top of the matter in Lagos State and that he was going about it the right way and that the cessation order seemed to have truncated what he was doing and that probably Lagos wouldn't have been amongst the state, Ogun, the federal capital territory, that would have been on this total lockdown. How do you want to react to that? Well, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for the governor as to what he would have done, yeah. but I think uh, whatever has happened would have been a natural process. And if you do recall, the governor was under pressure a few days before that lockdown. Uh, in fact, there were rumors that there was going to be a lockdown. And I think he kept saying that, look, when it's time, when the numbers are right, um, we'll let you know. We'll let you know. And I believe what probably happened was he probably, of course, was working in tandem with the federal government yes. and wanted the, the president to be the one to announce that lockdown. Uh, if you look at all the other parts of the world, the way forward, um, it's a process that you really can't run away from yes. if you want to contain the spread, especially in a country where our health system is very weak. Yeah. Now, people have talked <clears> about <throat> homegrown solutions that we seem to be borrowing a whole lot of system from, from, from um, countries that have, you know, well-structured working economy and um, um, data in place that 
the, the lockdown was not the solution, that other, other alternatives should have, been, should have been looked into before a lockdown, given the fact you also did state while you were talking that we live in a country where people, their, their daily source of sustenance is what, from what they can get every day. And now, don't you see this going against the, the lockdown? Because already people are taken to the streets, as we are right now. Well, Benny, you know, you, you don't reinvent the wheel in some, in, in, in some of these cases. Um, we have two But isn't that what we're doing now? No, no, no. Okay. We're not reinventing the wheel. I think we're trying to work and adapt to what is being done in other, pla in other parts. And we're also learning from the, from the experiences of others. Um, you were talking about Governor Fayemi, and if you do recall his statement, he mentioned the Ecuador, the Ecuador you yeah, know, um, experience. Yes. And basically what you had was a similar argument that, look, we live day to day. You can't lock us in. Um, and so they hit the roads. And then they hit the roads. And then what happened? And people started dying, you know, one by one. A country of, um, well, in fact, the, the, the state, the, the port city that was affected mostly has a population of, uh, I think, uh, under 2 million. And uh, you've had thousands now that have died because of the argument yes. that um, we have to leave. Uh, so it, 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 they're not easy decisions, but the way forward, especially the system that doesn't have a health system, you know, that can manage the process, yes. is to ensure that you limit that spread. It's very important that we limit the spread. And that's why you have the issue of containment. That's why you have the issue of uh, lockdown. Um, and the way I want to explain it, you know, if you give me time is, go ahead. you know, um, you know, if you have a, a, a family in, say, Victor, on Victoria Island with a husband and wife just stay together, yes, people say that they can afford to social distance. Uh, but then you look at a place where there are nine people in a room. Um, how do you social distance with nine people in a room? Exactly. Well, my response is this, and we have to understand it. It's about clusters. The husband and wife is a cluster. They, they don't social distance at home. They're together. Yeah. But once they're together and they stay alone, fine. Now, when you have um, a room where you have nine persons, if the nine of them, they have to be together. If they're together, fine, it's a cluster. Once nobody there has corona uh, virus, then they're safe, yeah. even when there are nine of them. Now, I can extend it and say, even if you have a household, or you know, what we call Agbole, where there are 200, um, fine, it's a cluster. Leave them in that cluster. The danger is that of that 200 that stay together, if they all decide to hit the streets, then there's a risk of bringing back the virus. Um, and, 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 and what basically the, 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 the health authorities are saying is, look, even if you must go to the market, please, two of, 200 of you in that household shouldn't go to Can't the market. Go to the market at all, so yes. Let few, maybe two, three, four. So if you have a family of 10, you don't need 10 of them hitting the roads. You just ensure that it's one person because that way you are limiting the risks. Now, that's the only way you can contain that spread. Because if you have a situation where everybody is caught in this, in the, you know, in, in the spread, in the outbreak, um, the hospitals are not even there. The beds are not there. The ventilators are not there. And, and so, like I said, they're not easy decisions, but it's, you, we've got two, two models. You've got the Ecuador model, and uh, you've got the other model where you, there's a lockdown, um, and that's it. Now, two weeks ago, during <coughs> the president's um, cessation order speech, he did say um, relief materials and distribution of food items will be, will be sent across to, cons to people considered to be the vulnerable and the poor. And there's been a whole lot of hula baloo and back and forth about who really the vulnerable yes. and the poor are. Yeah. And that in, in the recent distribution that has, gone, that has gone round so far, people have said for most of the people receiving distribution, they are not the vulnerable, they are not the poor. I, I need your quick take on this. Well, I mean, that's clear. I mean, if you look at the first round of palliatives, what you had, you know, is a situation where probably governments, um, in, you know, in, in power in the different uh, states, uh, gave their own political members in most cases. Um, so it was more for them rather than the vulnerable. But then it's expected in the sense that um, we don't have a social structure. We don't have any system that identifies readily the vulnerable, that identifies the poor, you know, the aged uh, uh, population. Yes. And therefore, there is a problem when situations like this arise. And, 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 and so this is not the time. It's not in, the, in, it's not in this emergency 
that you don't want to put that kind of a structure in yes. place. And so you have to work with what you have. And what do we have? We have a situation where a lot of those people who uh, are creating problems, for example, in some parts of uh, the country, um, belong to daily paid, as I would say, and unemployed. So, but, but many of them, quite a number of them are organized. In other words, you have the road transport uh, unions, for example, they have a structure. Uh, so you've got to identify that as a structure. You have the artisans, the vulcanizers, you know, the mechanics. They do have a structure. Uh, but if you're putting them at home for two weeks, then they're not going to work. You have the tailors. They have a structure. And so you must use what you have uh, to, to manage the situation. And therefore, you're going to have to identify those structures as a first step. Uh, then you are now left with those who probably sleep in the motor parks, who sleep under the bridge. And then you're able to say, okay, now we've, we've captured at least quite a bit of it. Yeah. Um, but then there's an order to it as, as opposed to what we have or what we've had to date. Um, and I think that's why maybe the governors were saying, the governors forum was saying that maybe they should allow them they're in the to best handle, position to, to handle, to the, handle the politics. Yes. Because oh, again, yeah. uh, again, it brings to fore the problems of our structure, where Abuja wants to distribute palliatives in every nook and cranny of uh, the country. They just are not in a position to do that. Right. You've got to allow the, 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 you know, the, the subsisting unit, this, the units uh, under them to do this. All right. Mr. Jimmy, we'll come to you still. And <coughs> joining us via Skype now is Nigeria's pioneer and ace comedian, Alibaba Akbobome. Thank you, Alibaba, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. We are a nation of over 180 million people, and out of that number, we have about 86 million Nigerians living in extreme poverty. Now, going by the lockdown and cessation order of the president two weeks ago and an extension which just took effect two days ago, many Nigerians are clamoring the fact that the policy has been put in place is not enough to keep people at home to totally restrict their movement. People are on the streets looking for what to eat. I need your reaction to this, Alibaba. The first thing is that we do not know whether we're 180 million people. Our data is not correct. We have been working with speculation since 1991, when the last census was organized. And um, I worked at that last census. And uh, when the one that was done in the 2000 was done, the, the conclusion was inconclusive. We, we did not come to a figure. There, were, there was a time it was bandied that it was 240 when arguments and a lot of uh, protests came up because people were complaining that they were not counted. Uh, some uh, census officials did not get to their place. The number was now reduced to what you now have as 200. And then from there, people now started accepting, okay, maybe 180. We do not have a synchronized demographic of these people in this country. So we do not even know whether it is 8 million, 80 million people who are underprivileged, 8 million people who need help. We do not know. So we're just flying, we're winking in the dark. So that is my position. All right. Now let's talk about the, the cessation order, the extension of the cessation order and issues of palliatives. Now, um, a cross-section of Nigerians have, have, um, have come out to say most of the people getting these relief materials are not people necessarily considered as vulnerable and the poor. Your reaction on this, Alibaba? Okay. Even the people arguing that the people getting these things are not, what data do they have? You do not even know if the people are poor. Because we do not have that. That is why I said that the basic, the, the, the foundation of our problem in this country is we do not know how many people we are. We do not know who needs what. Which is why we have the problem of countries like America accepting our passport and giving us free uh, on arrival visa. Because we cannot trace one person. If, for instance, somebody runs away from America and comes to Nigeria and you tell this uh, social the uh, security agencies to find it, they would not be able to find the person. And so the palliatives are getting to people that we do not know, we do not have a way of tracking the people that have them. What is the social structure? We do not have the social structure that can then help us tell who needs help, who is out of job, who has just gotten a job, who is paying tax, who is not paying tax, who needs help, what areas need... So we do not have all these statistics. So that is why we're just backing up the wrong tree. That is why I said that the people who are getting the palliatives right now may be the wrong people. They may be the right people. And so how do we judge that the people getting it are not the right people? Because we do not have data. We could go to the data and say, 
all of these people, for instance, Lagos State started a a residency uh, sensor. So they, they put these uh, tags on all the properties. So the properties are counted, and then they went around and did something to know how many people are living in the houses. And so they ha Lagos has something like that. What do we have nationally? You drive through certain places, especially you saw there was uh, some, it's not been, uh, uh, it's not been uh, uh, confirmed and certified, but there was a, a statistic that came out and said nearly all the palliatives are going up north. Now, how do you know that those people up north are the ones that needed it? Because if you drive through certain parts of the north, it's bare land. But when the time for elections come, you get amazing numbers from those places that still don't have people. So you're wondering, where are these people coming from? So it is hard to know whether the people who got the palliatives are the people who are supposed to get the palliatives, or they are being uh, shared by, by partisan uh, reasons. All right. Now, now Mr. Jumin, let, let's talk about the issue of, 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 the, of the National Social Register, the NSR. Now, we do know for sure that there are still people from the informal sector who, who live on daily income and are yet to be included in this NSR. Mm. What, what are we missing? What is critical here? Well, I mean, my understanding, I mean, along the lines of what Alibaba was saying, yeah. is how did that social register come about? Yeah. Um, if you look, if what is being circulated is... A child is, of necessity? It, no, no, no. I mean, you just had a situation where some people in positions of power decided that there was a way that they were going to give back to their own constituency. And so if you look at the way the social register has been put in place, it's, it's so loaded um, in, in, in one direction uh, that it's obvious that what you have there. I mean, there are states in that national social register, yeah. if, what, like I said, what is being thrown around is correct, that don't even have any, any, any name on the social register. Is it to say that those states don't have any, any poor? They don't have any vulnerable. So it's a situation of, look, I'm in charge. I'm in a position of influence. I'm in a position of power. I'm going to get as many people from my constituency that can be put on that social register. And I know that on a regular basis, uh, they will collect money. And uh, that takes care of my constituency. Hmm. There's no basis. And that, basically, I think that's what Alibaba so is we'll saying. So what makes it a bit partisan then? I mean, well, it's not even partisan. I think it's more of um, there's a lot of nepotism. There's a lot of um, selfishness. There's, you know, I mean, it's definitely not based on the reality. All right. Now, Alibaba, on, on the National Social Register, how, how do we begin to authenticate the, the, the validity of the NSR, in your opinion, as a means to well, assess the, is, the, the uh, vulnerable and the poor? It, it, the, the, it was set up right. It was set up. The purpose of the uh, NSR, it was right. It was right. The, the social uh, investment program was right. It was proper. What we then had was that some states were supposed to buy in to the project. Some states refused to buy into the project. And then those states that refused to buy into the project are now the ones that you either don't find on the statistics of the project of the program or some uh, states that uh, did not uh, fully implement or uh, activate their project. Now, it's an important project, but it should have been done right. And the lady, I, I know the lady that was in charge of it, I've spoken with her, in fact, I've helped to promote some of the things that they were doing. Uh, what we do in this country is that when something starts, we do not like to follow it through and then we quickly bring somebody else in who then changes the parameters of how these things are shared or how the statistics are collected. That's why we have we need to synchronize data. You have the BVN, you have the National ID card, you have uh, uh, your, your tax document, uh, uh, your team number. You have every, we just have, we need to synchronize. We do not know who is who. And that is the basic problem that now raises the issue of uh, doubt with the statistics and the figures. It is that we... We need to create an acceptable and commonly acceptable um, statistics of people. And the census is the only, thing to, uh, the only way to go about that. We do not have that, and that is the biggest problem. Politicians now try to favor certain areas because they know numbers are going to come from there during elections, or there are believable numbers that will come from there during elections. We do not really... Uh, the, the, the social uh, investment program was proper, properly set up and uh, managed for a time, but they were underfunded as well, as shown when uh, 
the National Assembly jumped in and said, oh, two trillion had been given to them. And the lady who was in charge of it came out and said, two trillion was approved, but only 600 million of that two trillion got to us. Now, I mean, that is the other oh, thing that I mean, we I mean, do in this country. We we'll, okay. we'll budget for something and say we're giving five billion to so so and so. By the time the budget comes, only two hundred million will be got will be gotten by the agency that is supposed to activate that project. And then, but it still then goes on as if that money was released. That's why we still have uh, the second Niger Bridge that's not been completed. Money was budgeted for it, right, but it was not released. Just with us, we'll come to you in a bit a little while. Now, you want to react to a few things he did say, and he, he also did say that census is still the only ver verifiable and authentic way for us to get our uh, real data. And we know in this country, in this part of the world, we have uh, a problem with the effective way of, of data collection. How do we begin to synchronize all these means to, to have a central hub? where we can rightly say every Nigeria, um, our social system is in that hub. And yeah. if, I have to, if I have to get to every household in Nigeria, <clears throat> by going to that hub, I know I have it. Yeah, I, I mean, basically, I think what Alibaba is saying is that data, data is, is key. Um, in fact, uh, I think it said that data is the new oil um, in the world. And that's why you find that countries that have data have strength. Companies that have data have strength. Um, 5G is about data, yeah. and it's about who has the powers over this data. So that is key. Now, having said that, Alibaba is suggesting sensors. Fine. Um, it's good to have sensors. But again... But should that be the only verified no, no, means no, no, no. for us to get no, our data? I, that's why I've emphasized data. Yeah. But you said I should react or, to, you yes. know, to him. Sensors. Now, Again, we have to look at the peculiarities of our country uh, in terms of sensors. What do we use our sensors for? Our sensors is used in terms of revenue allocation, for example. And that makes it very difficult to have good sensors in our country. And that's what has happened. Uh, our sensors is used in terms of voting, you know, and so it's rigged. It's rigged in most cases. And therefore, we may need to sit down and say, yes, data is key, but what data should we use? Uh, what steps should we take first? If we said today that we want to have sensors in two years' time, are we sure we'll be able to get good sensors for as long as we have the kind of constitution that we have yeah. where, you know, uh, revenue allocation or revenue sharing, because don't forget that we're, what, a feeding bottle economy, um, where it means that the more people you have, the more money you get to your, yourself. So you've got to first remove those um, problems. Those, 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 uh, you've got to review the structure in a way that people begin to appreciate that the census is not about what you get of the national cake, but it's about how things can work better for everybody. So census good, but timing has to be right. And other things have to be put in place before you get the census, or else you'll be like all the other census um, that we've ha had in recent times. Now, Alibaba, we have seen an increase in number of people on our streets. And is it safe to refer to these people as the poor and vulnerable people flocking into the streets in violation of the stay-at-home order in search of food? It, about 90% about of the people that you see on the streets are people who earn daily income. Those people who earn daily income survive only by what they earn that day. And then the next day, they then go out to hustle for what they'll survive with again. Now, let me tell you something that is happening in Lagos. The information has gotten out to a lot of people in the north that Lagos is working. And so, the person that is riding an Okada in uh, Damaturu, and when he rides that Okada in Damaturu, he can't, they're not born and well to charge somebody 1,000 naira to carry him from one point to another, or charge 500 naira to carry him from one point to another. But you see, that probably is how much he earns after like two days or three days, because the people in Damaturu and all those places, and Yobe and Jigawa, they charge is it 10 naira or 20 naira to carry somebody from one point to another. So information gets to the guy in, in uh, Damaturu or Kasina, that, or Duse, that uh, this bike that you are riding here, if you were riding it in Lagos, you can make what you make in one week in one hour. So what the guy does is he waits for a trailer that comes to, from Lagos to take people back to uh, take people, take pr products from the north. He pays 500 naira to put his bike on that trailer. The trailer gets him to Lagos. 
and he starts to hustle. He already knows how to ride the bike, so he starts to hustle. In one week, he probably can make about like two, three thousand naira. He sends the same message to another person in uh, in the north and says, "Oh boy, that bike that you're riding, get as many of them. Get Sule, get Suleiman, get uh, Mohammed, get uh, that attack. All of you come to Lagos. They will jump on the next trailer with their bikes. And don't forget that these bikes have been distributed to a lot of them during elections. And so they take those bikes and come to Lagos to hustle." The one that then makes good money after riding that bike for a while will give it to another boy that doesn't have a bike and then start driving Kekena Pep. And so, after a while, all of these people, where do they live? They can't afford to stay in any of all those uh, fine places. So, they live in shanties. And so, Lagos is already breaking down some of those shanties. A lot of people are homeless. A lot of people are broke. A lot of people survive by the bikes they ride every day. And the number keeps increasing in Lagos. Because the story has gone out that Lagos is working. Unlike all those states. Which brings to mind what uh, Uncle Jimmy just said. You know that this uh, sharing formula is what has actually crippled us. You have a state governor that doesn't earn as much as Lagos state governor. But he has two bulletproofs just like Lagos state governor. Everything Lagos state governor has, he wants to replicate in his state. But he doesn't want to replicate the factories that are in Lagos. He doesn't want to replicate the commercial activities that are in Lagos. And so he waits every month to collect that money from the governor, uh, from the federal government, and then goes on the spending spree. In fact, what they do is they just wait. Once they share, they wait again for the next one. Alibaba, it is not like that. So Alibaba. what the best... Yeah. It should wrap up your thoughts now. Yeah. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. And so what we need to do is to make sure, as uh, Uncle Jimmy has said, is to make sure that we change this issue of revenue sharing. Let every state survive by themselves and donate something to the center. Let's even say, uh, uh, River State, because of what you are earning, give us 20%. Uh, Jigawa, because of what you are earning, give us 10%. Let them be bringing money to the center so that federal government can use that money. You will see that things will change. Not that a state that doesn't even have money to survive is sending 2,000 people to, to, to Hajj and pay for pilgrimage. Meanwhile, they don't have money to even set up factories. So all of those people that are not employed in all of those states are trickling down to places where you have a seemingly survival rate, increase in survival rate. So that's why they are coming to Lagos. All the people you are seeing in Lagos, some of them are not even Lagosians. Awan oh, Alibaba, thank you for your contribution in this segment. Still stay with us. We'll be with you. You'll join us in the second segment. Now, do, do you think if, if these politics are channeled through the state governors like they're clamoring for, do you think it to be effective? Well, I won't say it will be effective. Okay. It will be better than what we have. Uh, because, again, you can... Yeah, but, but better doesn't mean it will get to the people it's meant to get to. No, no, to no. What because... I'm saying is it will be an improvement because, okay. one, you know who you're going to hold accountable. Uh, so you can hold your, it's easier to hold your governor accountable than to hold the president of the Federal Republic accountable. Now, there's a lot of pressure if you look at areas like Lagos. And, and that's why we're saying that, look, you've got to look at the best way under the present circumstances. And that's why I was suggesting that we can use those structures that are already in place. You can't create new structures at this point in time. Uh, so that it's not going to be there, but even the developed countries are having the same problem. I mean, you have to understand the situation where there's no money. If you if you if you watch the, the you know the, the news, you see even in America there are people that are that have vehicles that have cars and are still going to the food food you know to the food kitchens because they don't have any money. So you have a car yes, but you don't have money to eat. You don't have anything, so you still go. So a lot of people just don't have money to to buy food, and so as much as possible, you it'll get better. But I won't say that we will get there. We're going to have to put in place a structure as we move on. That might be a, a, a good fallout of the kind of emergency that we have found ourselves. All right. Mr. Jimmy Agbaje, thank you for your contribution on this segment. Thank you. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, the possibility of rescue Nigerians stranded abroad looks dim. This is Opmax for discussion. We will be right back.